today. Awesome. Good. Getting used to my new table up here. It's not quite quite tall enough for me, but we can't all be six feet tall and above, right? You so. won't hear that, I guess. Right, I'm paying attention to me anyway. Uh, so I hope everyone had a uh, had a great Christmas, um, a great New Year, and uh, it's time to kick off, kind of kick off 2014, and kind of had that in mind. That, um, I do want to, before I start my sermon, we were down in Destin last week, and we went to this church called the Destiny Worship Center, and it was just an awesome experience. They just had an awesome worship, uh, and, and the songs, and, and the sermon really, like, spoke to me, and Still in a couple of his things today, so I want to give him credit. His name was Steve Vagola, I believe is how he pronounced it. It was V A G G O L L O. So, uh, but I, I, would, I would say a couple of the things he said, and, and several things uh, are, are going to be for me, and then hopefully it's all from God and, and what God wants to share with you all today. But it was, it was just such an awesome sermon and such a great way I thought to start the year, and it, it kind of went along with where we were at in our, our study of the, the great books of the Bible. Uh, we're actually, my, my topic was the Sermon on the Mount, and I chose the very last paragraph of that. It's in Matthew 7, uh, verse 24 through 27. And we're going to talk about living, living the Word, living the Word of God and, and what that means. And as I was thinking about the Word, I kind of was thinking about words in general and what we use them for. Because I think we kind of get confused about what the Word of God is versus words that we have, and words are really kind of the building block of communication. I know you might say letters are, but, you know, N and X and P and stuff like that, they don't mean anything to you unless you, you took four or five math classes like, like I did last semester. That's the only time those, those letters really, really mean anything. you got to put them together to make words before they start meaning anything to anybody. So, you know, kind of when you're when you're talking, we use, we use words to do several things. We use it to communicate with. Uh, it's, it's the main thing that we use words with. And we speak words. That's most people's favorite way of communicating. It's kind of the easiest. Um, you don't have to put a lot of thought into it, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, but, but we speak to each other. And we we kind of go back and forth. Um, we write them. And how many people like writing in school? Oh, we've got either we've got some liars in the house today. Or, or we've got some people that really like writing. I know I could not stand it. I hate it. I always thought it was kind of like, I was like, what's the point of me being able to tell you what I can do or writing it out when I could just do it and, and show you, you know? Um, but now, even though most of the people in the room didn't raise their hand, there were a few, we all write a lot more than we used to now, right? Because how many people have a social media account? But it, writing has become a lot bigger means of communication because we text each other, we Facebook each other, we tweet each other. Um, some of us might even write blogs. I don't know. Um, I've not. I've thought about maybe doing that, but I've never ventured out and actually done it. But we write a lot more um, to communicate. We also read words. Um, you know, all this written communication out there now, where it's on the internet. You know, you read what other people are doing on Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff. So we read sometimes. Sometimes we even listen to what somebody else is saying. I know that's kind of a lost art sometimes, but um, sometimes when somebody's talking to us, we actually uh, listen. And, and that's, that's biblical if you want to know. Uh, the Bible does say we should listen more than we even actually speak. Um, so, so when somebody's talking to you, you know, try to maintain that eye contact and, and listen to them. Hopefully some of you all will, will listen to me. Um, I know everybody will hear me, but... Uh, hopefully some of you will listen today. Hopefully God, God will use the words that I'm going to do. And uh, sometimes, I thought this would be fun, we overuse words. Um, you know, some of these words we use and, and we go on and on about and we kind of get sick of hearing them. So I found a little article um, it's appropriate for the new year. I don't know if anybody's anybody ever seen like at the end of the year where they retire some words that everybody's just kind of getting sick of hearing. And we say, okay... 2013, we heard that enough. 2014, let's get that word out of our out of our vocabulary. Let's, you know, everybody just stop using it. And I, and I brought a little list of some words I found that have been retired. This is according to the Huffington Post. But uh, some of these words have been retired. And uh, you young people, especially you ladies, 
I know you're really going to be disappointed, but uh, selfie. We, we're going to get rid of selfie. I know looking at my Facebook feed, we can actually not only stop using the word, but we can probably get rid of the selfie itself. Um, especially there was one in particular, I read an article about the selfies that can go. Does anybody know about the fish face selfie? Like, if you're not familiar, I'm going to demonstrate. But <laughs> this is the really the most annoying se selfie, and I've, 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 I may hurt somebody's feelings because I've met some of you in here have done a fish face selfie. It's kind of like this. <laughs> it's like you're kind of like you're kissing somebody, but you really, you know, that one can, it's out of here, you know. If you're doing the fish face selfie, it can go. You know, we still make pictures of yourself, that's fine. Um, but uh, selfie, the word, we, we got to get rid of that. Another one we can thank our, our friend Miley Cyrus for, twerk. twerk. We can actually get rid of twerking itself too. So, uh, But that word, it, you know, we're sick of it, we're done with it, we're going to get rid of that. This one kind of cut me because it's near and dear to my heart because I love Twitter. I know I've, I've said I really like Twitter a lot, but I guess speaking and saying hashtag. So, you know, you can still hashtag stuff on Twitter, but don't. Don't say, you know, when you see somebody doing something stupid, don't say, hashtag SMH. I guess we just shouldn't speak like, like we're, we're tweeting. Um, another one, and I'm going to drop some knowledge on you here. This is another one, and I know we've all used this one. And whether we like it, or we don't like it, or we don't care, this is one I know we have all gotten sick and tired of hearing because we've heard it for five years now. It's not just 2013. Um, Obamacare. We're sick. We are sick of this word. I don't know how many people, I've even started calling this because I got so sick of saying that. It is actually called, and if you hear this word, it's actually called the Affordable Care Act. So we can get rid of Obamacare and we can call it the Affordable Care Act and, and you can stop saying that word or if you see that word, that's, that's what it actually is called. So we're going to ditch Obamacare. Um, the saying, we think baseball for this, something is on steroids, you know, like, oh man, that sermon Daniel did today was on steroids. That was like, you know, I, I don't know what you guys say, but it's kind of an obnoxious term, you know, um, anything ending with apocalypse or getting, like, uh, has anybody called Monday cold again or cold apocalypse, you know, the bridge was what was the bridge? Huh? Bridge again? Shermagin. When they had the bridge? Shermagin. 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 There we go. Yeah, those. That's, we're we're kind of getting old. And uh, I had a, a couple of personal nominations. These weren't on there, um, but they're kind of from the world of sports. If anybody knows, I'm a big sports fan. And one of them is my, my actually my Wildcats and, and our fan base, and we're kind of guilty of this one. But calling something the we're the blank nation. You know, like, we, we're so bad, we have two. We're the Wildcat Nation and the Big Blue Nation. Um, but all these fans, if you're calling yourself the Hoosier Nation or the Cardinal Nation, or I, I think it started out in Oakland with the Raider Nation, you know, it, it's not really original anymore if everybody's using it. So we can ditch that. We'll just say, you know, I'm, hey, I'm a cat fan or I'm a car fan or whatever. Kind of wear your shirts and let people know. And uh, Louisville fans, my other one, I'm... I'm going to hurt you. This is going to cut deep. <laughs> but I know every every single person, and some of you all got to be getting tired of this too, and most people, you know, a lot of people see it and they don't even know what it means. They're like, what does that mean? L1C4 has got to go. It sounds like, it sounds like, it sounds like, like a, a, a ward of the prison or something like that. It, it's terrible. Most people don't even know what it means. And, and it's just, it's got to go, L1C4, got to go, it's out of here. So those are just some of the words that have been overused and, and that, that we can get rid of in, in 2014. So, uh, But today's words are going to be out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 28. And I'm going to go ahead and, and read that. This is Jesus talking, and he's closing up, you know, he's just giving a sermon on the mount. Sermon on the mount's in Matthew 5 through 7. If you want to start 2014 off right, it's a great, great thing to read. I mean, you could almost read it every day or, or once a week, and it just really will touch you every day. It'll be something you'll say, man, I didn't do that. I didn't do that yesterday, or, or I didn't do that today, or, or something like that, but it's great. And Jesus is, is telling everybody that's gathered there, he says, and everybody get, get a Bible out if you, if you 
you don't have one, because I'm going to go to two or three verses, and I really want you to, to focus on these, and I don't have them up on the floor. So. Uh, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came, and the wind blew and slammed against the house and it fell. And great was its fall. Great was its fall. Oh, Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you so much for bringing us here this week, Lord. And we can just share your word and we can worship you and, and just enjoy each other's company, Lord. Um, speak through me as I deliver this message, Lord, on, on your word and, and what it means to us. And just open the hearts of those that are here to, to hear it, Lord. And we can get our, our ears off to 2014, off to, to a holy and, and godly start, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So Jesus is this. He just finished this great sermon on the mountain, and, he, and he's preached, and, you know, he, there's like thousands of people there, and, and he's told them all this stuff, and, and it's, it's like you got to hear Jesus preach. And he tells people, you know, these words of mine, if you follow them, it's going to be like you built your house on a rock. The foundation was a rock, and it's going to be able to withstand the beating. Your house is going to be that, that house. Your life is going to be that house that was built on a rock, and it's going to be able to go through any storm and weather any storm. But if you don't, if you hear me, and you hear these words, and, and you don't follow them, you're going to be like a house that's built on the sand. You know, when the rain comes, um, I don't know if, if you know about building, but, you know, it's going to wash out. Your foundation and, and there's going to be cracks starting to show in the concrete and stuff like that and then you're going to start seeing cracks in your drywall and then one day you're going to pull in your driveway and your roof's going to kind of look cockeyed or saggy and you know eventually that house is going to fall it's just not going to stand up to the to the times and, and that's how our life can be when we don't put god's word into action and when we talk about God's Word, um, and, and I know you hear this a lot, you say, we, we say the Word, you know, listen to the Word, and listen to the Word, and that's what this sermon's about, and we're going to cover three things. First off, what is the Word? Secondly, how can we live the Word? And third, speaking the Word. And the first thing I want to talk about is what is the Word? How do you get off this one, I don't like this new thing. It's got 10 buttons instead of 2. The old one was, was better. But what is the Word? Well, the Word is God's Word. The Word is God's Word. And a lot of times we, we kind of limit that. We don't really put it into its full perspective. Because if, if I ask everybody in here, what is the Word of God, you would probably say it's what's written down right here, right? I, I would At least 9 out of 10 people would tell me, it's what's written down in the Bible. And that's true. That is the Word of God. And, and that's a, a tangible, physical thing that we can look at. But if you read in here, you're going to see that the Word of God is, is much more. And the first place I want to go is right in the beginning. And I'm going to show you that, that the Word of God is more. God's Word is all creation. God's Word is all creation. So when God speaks, He creates I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And, you know, just all there is is darkness. And what did God say? He said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. There was light, right? And then he spoke, and there was, there was water. And then there was land separating the water. And if you read through the story of creation, everything happens as God speaks. It's the words coming out of God's mouth. And it's creating, and it's creating, and it creates the stars and everything we see in the sky, and it creates the universe, and it creates this earth. And then his words create the animals and, and the plants and the fish. And then his words create us. So God's word is really all of creation, and, and it's what he created when he spoke that, that we see and that, that we live in. And then God's Word also guides us. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And when we think about God's Word, a lot of times we think about, to me, this is, is like the Holy Spirit. And, and when we accept Christ as our Savior, 
the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, and, and it's kind of like a guide on our, on our feet. Has anybody seen the commercials? I think it's Fidelity or it's something, but it's talking about, uh, it's usually got a, a young couple or somebody, and they're like, how are we ever going to retire? And uh, <laughs> all of a sudden, like a green line shows up, and it starts shooting off, and it's like, oh, start here. And, uh, you know, it walks them to their Fidelity office, or I think there's a car one, too, where the... Yeah, the start line goes to CarMax and it ends up there. But God's Word and the Holy Spirit is kind of like that. When we come to accept Christ as our Savior, we have that Holy Spirit in our life. It's kind of like a line showing up that lights our path and says, go here, go here. And God's going to call us and He's going to speak to us and He's going to say, go here, do this, follow me. Here's, here's what I want you to do. And we have that light to our feet. And God's Word also saves God's Word also saves. Uh, and you're going to say, I know, I know you're probably saying, Pastor Dan, Jesus saves. And Jesus died on the cross and, and, and he, he came to save us. And, and that's what saves. And you're right. You're absolutely right. Jesus and His grace is the only thing that saves. But I want, I want you to turn, and, and this is really awesome. It's one of my favorite passages. I want you to turn to John chapter 1. And I want everybody to turn there because this is this is awesome, and this is probably something that, that you haven't read. It talks about how expansive God's Word is. In John 1, chapter 1, everybody got it? Everybody looking? Everybody still looking? 1 and 2. The very beginning. Don knows. Don knows about heart. I see one. <laughs> and John's Gospel says, In the beginning was the Word. And we saw that. We saw that God's Word creates. And it was there in the beginning. And it says, And the Word was with God. And then this was the second, third part here. And the Word was God. And then in chapter two or verse 2, it says, He was in the beginning with God. Now what that means is, is that not only is the Word of God all creation, and not only is it the words that are written in this Bible, but that Jesus was also the Word of God. We, when God spoke out all creation, He knew that He was going to come and form Jesus. He knew that, that Jesus was going to be our Lord and Savior and that, that Jesus was going to be a part of that creation and, and a part of Him was going to come to save us. And it just shows you that God's Word is so important to us as, as, as Christians. And when we come to know Christ as our Savior and when we profess that He is our Savior, we are also professing that we believe in the Word of God and that we are going to follow the Word of God and the Word of God is going to guide our lives as well. And when we, when we come to do that, we have to, we have to understand what it means to live the Word and to live as a follower of Jesus. And I want you to write this down. This is the, the part I really want you to write down, this, this saying right here. What does the Word say? What does the Word say? When we come to know Christ and we want to live in His presence and we want to live by the Word of God, this has got to be at the forefront of our attention. I know we used to have these bracelets um, when I was in high school, and I don't know how long they went on, but, but they said, what would Jesus do? Does anybody remember oh, those so bracelets? Yeah. And, and that's an awesome thing to ask. When you're making decisions in your life and when you're presented with situations, what would Jesus do in this situation? And I'm going to tell you what Jesus would do. Jesus turned to the Word of God. When he was in tough situations, he turned to the Word of God. We know he was perfect. He always followed God's will in his life. And, and, and he always did what he said. Does anybody, I'm going to tell you about the most trying time in Jesus' life. Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days. He went out into the desert and he fasted. He had no water, no food. And this was right before he started his ministry. And he went out there and he went out into the desert to, to really uh, focus on God and get ready for what he was about to do and, and to get ready. And he was, he was praying and, and we know that he was out there. And, and the devil came to tempt him. And just like us, and we go, you know, we're out in the world. Me and Sarah talked about it today in our, in our small group lesson. You know, it's easy to be faithful in here when you're surrounded by other Christians and when you're surrounded by people that, that believe. But sometimes we get out in the world and uh, there's no one else around, or maybe we're at school, maybe we're at work, 
we don't know where everybody stands. You know, there may be other Christians, but, but we don't know who they are. And sometimes, you know, they don't know who we are. Unfortunately, we're, we're like that. But it's harder out there to show that faith. And it's harder. And Jesus is out here in the desert all alone. He hasn't eaten for 40 days. He hasn't had anything to drink. And he's just been praying. And the first thing Satan says is, I know you've got to be hungry. I know you've got to be hungry. And he tells him, he says, you're the son of God. Why don't you turn that rock into bread? And Jesus doesn't rely on his own instincts. He doesn't rely on his self to get him through this. He says, but the word of God says, man will not live on bread alone. He turns to Satan and he says, the word of God says, man will not live on bread alone. And Satan flies him up and whisks him up to a, to a cliff. And they're standing on top of this cliff. And, and if you saw the, um, if you saw the, the mini series, the Bible, that the History Channel did, it was just awesome seeing this part of it because it, it just put it into to visual. And Satan says, you're the son of God. Jump off this cliff and fly away. I know you can do it. Just fly out of this desert. There's no reason for you to stay here. And Jesus says, the word of God says, thou shalt not test the Lord your God. He tells Satan, the word of God says, thou shalt not test the Lord your God. And then Satan comes to him and Satan says, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. If you bow your knee to me and you follow me, you can be king of everything on this earth. You can be king of all this world. You can have total dominion over this world. You can do whatever you want with all these people. It's yours anyway. You're, you're God's son. You deserve it. And Jesus says, the word of God says, thou shalt hold no one above the Lord your God. Even Jesus, even Jesus who is the word, turned to the word and said, when he, was, when he was tempted by Satan. And if we're in our life, the way we can continue to, to stay in Christ's grace, the way we can continue to, to live out this word, is when we have to make a decision to say what, say the same, what does the word say? What does the word say? I'm sure, I, I hope everyone has one of these at home. Um, and, and if you don't, we've got a bunch of them. You can, you're certainly welcome to take one with you. Um, you know, they, they cost like $5. We can get more. We'd love to have more. We want you to have one in your home. But when we come up on a question, when we come up with a, with a trial, or we come up with a tribulation, we have to learn to turn to the Word. And if you don't think that there's something in there for you, there, there is. You want to be a better student, a better worker? What does the Word say? The Word says work like you're working for God. Don't work like you're working for that jerk boss you got, you know, the one that's always riding you down and Cindy knows. Cindy knows all about it. <laughs> the one that's putting you down and telling you you don't know, you know, you don't know what you're doing, or or doesn't really help out, or um, you know, the, the boss that sits back in the office with the door closed and you're not sure what they're doing all day. You just know they want you to do a lot of work and, and you have no idea where they're at, you know. Don't work like you're working from that boss. That boss is just another human being. That boss is just another human being. Work like you're working for God. Maybe it's at school and you've got that teacher who they're just not going to cut you a break. Maybe they, they know about your past or, or maybe you, you've never really worked hard up to this point and, and you, you think your teacher's looking down on you. And you don't think there's... It doesn't matter. You're not, you're not working for that teacher. Act like you're working for God. Do the work to glorify your God instead of to glorify that teacher or to glorify yourself. Maybe it's about parenting. Maybe you want to know... How am I supposed to be a good, better parent? Look to the Word of God. There's examples of good parents. There's examples of bad parents. And it clearly lays out what's good, what's bad. There's a lot of, a lot of studies, you know, how do we discipline? Should we discipline? Yes, you should. Should we make our kids mine? Yes, you should. What happens when you play favorites? It's trouble. <laughs> what happens when, when, you know, there's all these things. That there's examples of good parents. There's examples of bad parents. Um, and, and a lot of times, I think sometimes the outside, there, there's so many stories of people doing bad things, and, and if, if you go out in the world, they're going to use it, they're going to say, well, look what so-and-so did in the Bible. Is that what God's all about? Well, no, it's not what God's all about. If you read the story, you would know that, that God, that was in there to illustrate what somebody did that was wrong. And, uh, but, but, you know, you want to be a better parent. You want to be a better worker. You want to be a better friend. You want to improve 
the life that you have around you and who your friends are and, and what's going on. It's in the Word of God. And we have to be willing to ask this question first and foremost. What does the Word say? And the last thing we have is speaking the Word. What do our words say? What are your words saying? And we get on along in that story of creation, and you're going to see that the main difference between us and the rest of everything that was created, you know, God created us in His likeness, right? What does, what does that mean? If you study a biology book or, or you're in school, they're going to tell you. What, what are they going to They're going to tell you we're just like animals, right? And if you cut us open and, and you look at us and you look at our body and, and how it operates, we are. We're not that different. My body is not that different from my dog's. My dog has the same amount of leg bones. My dog has the same amount of bones in her arm. I don't know about her hands and her feet. They're probably different. But if you look at it, it's probably not that different. My dog has a rib cage. You know, it's got a longer nose than I do, I, I think, anyway. Uh, I would say it's got a, a small brain in mine, but I'm not sure about that either. Uh, but there's a brain in its head. There's lungs in its, in its chest. There's a heart in there. There's a stomach. You know, it has to go to the bathroom and stuff like that. I do it inside, it does it outside, but we're a little different there. But we're not that different. You don't have a tail, man. I don't have a tail. <laughs> if I did, you and I'd wag it every time I saw you. But, um, you know, we're not, we're not that different. But my dog, it can bark, but it doesn't, doesn't speak. And it doesn't speak to other dogs. It doesn't have words. And I think when God created us in His likeness, what he really gave us was our own words. And just like God, our words can create and destroy what's going on around us. And, and, and if you don't think so, I want you to think about, have you ever said something that destroyed a friendship? As a parent, have you ever said something to your child that you really regretted? It probably brought them down a notch. Or have you ever said something to somebody that really lifted them up and really encouraged them and built them up? Just like our words, just like God created us with, with His words, our words can create and destroy those of the people that are around us. And I think about, you know, one, one thing, I, I, I'm sometimes I'm, I get angry and, and it's something I deal with and I really pray, you know, when you're doing our, our communion, that, that's really weighing on me right now is, is trying to learn to, to get less angry and, and not get angry as quick. It's something I deal with. I know it's it's a sin and I really want to change and I, I, I'm trying to turn it over to God. But sometimes, you know, like we saw, I really expect a lot out of him. You know, I know he's a smart kid. I know he's got like the world ahead of him. And I want to, uh, it, you know, I expect so much out of him. Sometimes like it's like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you perfect? You know, and um, sometimes when you say that, you know, he, 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 I feel like sometimes, you know, maybe sometimes he doesn't know how much I think of him. And maybe he might be, you know, getting torn down. I, I really am trying to get better about that. And, uh, but I, I, I'd say with our kids, it's, it's an excellent opportunity to build someone up or tear them down. How many people's parents, how many people had like some kind of crazy dream as a child, like your dream job or what you wanted to do when you grew up was like, you know, you, you didn't want to be uh, something, I don't know, normal. You know, you didn't want to go sit at a desk or, or do something. You know, you wanted to go be a rock star or anybody have any? What, what, what was it? I wanted to be a dolphin tamer. A dolphin tamer. See, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's dolphin tamers out there. You know, what I wanted to always be was a race car driver. I, w I loved race cars. I loved playing race car video games. If we were on vacation, the first place I wanted to go was the go-kart track. And I wanted to sit there all day long. And I would get <laughs> angry if I didn't. I would start. You know, a lot of people, where do you want to start? They want to go sit up in the front, right? So they're like out in the lead and they're like, I'm going to win because I'm out in the front. <laughs> do you know what I do? I intentionally said, so how many people are in this line? All right, I'm sitting in the back car. 
because I wanted to race every single person and get to the front by the time we pulled back in there. That's what I wanted to do. And uh, I went to, when, we, when I was like 12 or 13, we went to Disney World, and they had this awesome game. It was called Daytona USA, and uh, mm -hmm. some people might probably remember it. It was on the Sega or something. But in arcades, they would have like, in Disney World, you know, it's mega arcade. And they had eight of these suckers sitting right next to each other. And they were like the whole big deal where you got in the car and it shook and vibrated and everybody had their own screen. And you would have eight man races. And when the day we were there, they had a contest where you could enter in this thing. And, and they had like, I want to say 16 races. And they kind of whittled it down to one final race of eight. And if you won, you got to go to the Richard Petty Driving School and drive a real NASCAR car. And that was your thing. You got to get trained to drive a real NASCAR car. So I got in this thing, and I had this game at home, and I'd played it in arcades before. And uh, I won the first race, like easily. I was way out in front. The second race, I won again. And here I am in this final race on this arcade game, and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going to get to go drive a stock car, a real one. And uh, came around the last turn, and, and somebody wrecked me, and then this other person passed both of us, and they won. The experience, but I really wanted to drive a race car. But you know, my mom and dad were great, they always pushed me. But my dad's a banker, my mom worked at a furniture store, and they always said it costs too much to race cars. You're not going to ever end up being a race car driver, you, that's not what you're going to do. You know, you need to focus on your school, you need to go to college, you need to do this and do that and get a real job. You know, you're not going to be a race car driver. But somebody is a race car driver. You know, there's probably a thousand of them, two thousand of them, running around this country driving race cars. There's dolphin tamers. You know, you go down to Florida, people at SeaWorld, there are dolphin tamers. And uh, one thing I told Wendy, I said, whatever Saul and Jesse say they want to do, I want to encourage. I want to say, here's what you need to do to do that. Here's the steps you need to take to do that. And put a path out in front of them. Now they can choose whether or not they want to do that or not. Um, it's their, it's going to be their choice, and I'll love them no matter what. But I want them to know that there is a path to do those things. And I think when, when God gives us those words, and, and we can use our words to influence those around us to do good things. And one thing that we can create in those around us that's an amazing thing is create a relationship with Christ. How many people know people that do not have a relationship with Christ? Yeah, pretty much every single person here probably knows more people that don't have a relationship with Christ than they know that do have a relationship with Christ. I want to tell you, there's only one thing that's going to lead any of those people to Christ. It's somebody that knows Christ telling them about your relationship with Christ. When you plant that seed and you tell somebody else, you can create a flower that's going to bloom into somebody having a relationship with Christ. And it's the difference between them going to heaven and them going to hell. Our words can move somebody from one list to the other. Our words can create this awesome relationship that we have with Christ in somebody else. And they can, they can create that in, in their life today. But just like that, our words can also destroy that. When we don't speak, that person may never be presented. Andy has a good saying, you know, you may be the only Jesus that somebody ever sees. You know, sometimes if we don't say something, we're, we're, we're not destroying. It's just never been built. You know, you can't destroy something that, that's never been there. Sometimes we can say things, we can be hateful, we can be bad examples of Christ, and, and, and when we say those things, that destroys that possibility, that, that relationship. In the world. And I think we all see that out in, in the world today. Most people that are atheists, most people that are non-believers, their complaints aren't about Jesus. Do you ever hear somebody say, I just hate Jesus? Man, that Jesus, he was a low life. Or man, that Jesus, he ain't got no answers. Most of them even say, Jesus, great example, great teacher, great, you know, taught you how to live. 
Their problem's not with him, it's usually with somebody that they've encountered at some church or somebody they saw on TV saying something hateful or something ridiculous, you know. So our words, just as they can create, they can also destroy. And I want to challenge everybody today. In 2014, I want to make this for our church and for everyone in here, the year of the word. And I want to lay this challenge down to you. I, and I ask you to write it down before. But here's how we're going to do that. If you didn't write it down already, I want this is what I want you to take home with you. What does the word say? When we're out there, we got to remember, are we following the word or are we following the world? Are we following what God says? Are we, are we reading our Bible? Or are we praying and asking Him for guidance? Are we following the words in this book? Are we just going along, drifting around out in the world, listening to what the world has to say, using it? You know, the world's, man, it's good. It's good at its job. You know, Satan's out there. He's doing, he's doing, he's doing good. He's doing good work for his side. He's, he's, he's getting people to rationalize things. He's getting Christians to say stupid stuff, just like I said, and, and make it sound like we're a bunch of hateful people, which we're not. If you've been in this room, you know you know that's not true. But he's getting people to, to slowly erode away at what they really believe and about what God says. And he's getting other people to, to make you think you're ridiculous. It's ridiculous to follow God. It's ridiculous to believe um, what the Word says. He's getting, you know, he's making it look a, a, a lot fun. He's, he's, he makes people think that it's not fun. To be a Christian, it's a lot more fun to be out doing all this other stuff in the world. And, and, you know, you don't want to get up on Sunday morning. You know, if they really wanted you to come to church, they'd have church at 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. They'd rather you be out all night and, and not sleep in. You know, there's so many things out there that, that the world's kind of pulling that we have to refocus constantly. And the way we can refocus this year and refocus our, our relationship with Christ is turn to the Word of God whether it's by prayer or whether it's by picking up this Bible. And know that when you accepted Christ as your Savior, or if you have yet to and you want to accept Christ as your Savior, that you're not only saying that I believe that you died for me on this cross, but you're saying He is the embodiment of the Word of God, and I believe that as well and everything in it. So we we'll go ahead and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we step out into this year, Lord, and as, uh, as we get started, whether we're going to, to work, to school, whatever we're doing, Lord, um, let, us, let, us, let us carry, carry your word, Lord. Let it be the most important thing to us as followers of you, Lord. And remind us that when we accepted you as our Savior, Lord, that we took that word into our hearts. And if we want to follow you, Lord, then that's all we have to look to. We can bring it to you in prayer, Lord, and we can go to that Bible and, and, and read, Lord. Read what you want us to do and, and where you want us to go and, and how we need to follow you. And Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you and that hasn't accepted you, Lord, and is, is, doesn't know about that word, Lord, and I just want them, I want you to call them today, Lord. Call them home to you, Lord. Let them come into your arms. Let them, let them see and feel that relationship with you today, Lord. God, we love you. We love all you did. And we thank you so much for, for you dying on the cross for us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I want you to, if you want to renew and start 2014 off on, on the right foot, I want you to, to think about why we're sitting here while we're singing. You really kind of gotten away from the Word of God. You want to, want to renew. You want us to pray for you. Please come up here. Um, I can pray with you. I can pray for you.